This is Bernard Jochti and today I'm going to talk about the question by a user called T. Alexander E. It's about my uh, recording of the Chopin Etudes Opus 10, more precisely about number three, the Lento Manon Troppo in E major, and the question of single beat versus double beat application for the metronome marking. So here's the question. In segment five of your introduction to Beethoven a tempo, you talked about the metronome marking in quavers in a time signature with crotchets, three, four bar, and you said, in relation to the note value of the time signature, which is a crotchet, the value of the metronome marking is already halved, namely a quaver. In this case, we can continue in single beat. But isn't that what we have in this Chopin etude, so opus 10, number three? The measure is counted in crotchets and the metronome marking is a quaver. Am I missing something here? So that's the question. And basically, it's about why um, I used a variable application of single beat and double beat for my first Beethoven recording, but not for the Chopin etudes, which are played in an overall double beat uh, application, sort of, not always precisely, but clearly inspired <clears throat> by that. It's a great question to have a closer look at the double beat theory itself and what it can do and what it cannot do. First of all, and this is very important, the double beat theory is a modern approach. If you look at the music writing both in the 19th and the 20th century up to 1980, you will not find the term double beat or full beat or whole beat connected to a metronome anywhere. It doesn't exist. The first person who came up with the idea and who presented a first version of the double beat theory was Wilhelm Rezetalsma in his book Die Wiedergeburt der Klassiker, which came out in 1980. Uh, and it's actually in this context, uh, it's interesting to have uh, a look uh, at the history of that theory. Because when Talsma uh, developed that theory, he faced a problem. And it speaks for him as a musician that he acknowledged that problem. And that problem is that he was sort of uh, able to solve the problem for uh, questionably fast metronome markings for fast movements. But at the same time, he got a problem with the slow movements. Because with double beat, the slow movements would become too slow. As the fast movements become too fast in single beat. So therefore, Talsma knew that if double beat was an issue at all, it must have uh, been a variable application of single beat and double beat to make sense musically. So he suggested that the fast movements like Allegro, Presto, um, would be understood according to double beat, but the slow movements starting by, with a moderato and going down to Adagio Largo, etc., would still be a single beat. That makes um, a lot of sense for many metronome markings uh, from the early years and decades of the metronome. But of course, if you present something like that, you get a methodical problem because this is not a system. <laughs> and there is a high risk of choosing between double beat and single beat almost haphazardly. This is why Later on, Clemens von Gleich and Johann Sonnleitner came up with a more sophisticated um, version of the double beat uh, theory. And they said that, uh, or after their uh, approach, there is a uh, relationship, a connection between the metronome marking itself and conducting movements. Let's take an example, a 3-4 bar. You can conduct a 3-4 bar in different ways. You can uh, execute a full beat for the whole bar, like 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. That's, for instance, how you conduct a waltz. And I talked about that some more in Q&A number two, and also showed some clips where you can actually see conductors conducting that way. If the movement is slow, you don't conduct that way, but 
for instance, you can conduct, you can uh, execute a full beat for every um, crotchet, like one, two, three, one, two, three. So the thesis uh, presented by Sonnleitner and Van Gleich is now that people may have treated the metronome F as if it was a conductor, which it was supposed to be in the first place, just to replace somebody conducting next to you at the piano or wherever. So they say if a metronome marking describes the whole bar for a three, four bar, let's say dotted minimum equals something, then this means a full beat for the entire bar. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And the metronome marking uh, can be understood as a double beat uh, indication. On the other hand, if the metronome marking says quaver equals something, then it's not about a full beat, but about the single beats performed on every uh, quaver. One, two, three. Therefore, the metronome marking uh, is understood as single beat. Now, that is an actual system and it's backed up with conducting practice that is still common today. But once again, it is a modern system. There is no historical description connected to a metronome of such a system. As a side remark, actually the only document that mentions uh, double beat counting in an explicit way is a warning against double beat counting that came out in 1816. I introduced that document in my general introduction to historical metronome markings and tempo, and I will talk about it some more in the next uh, Q&A. So, if that system presented by uh, Sonnleitner and Van Gleich is a modern one, does that mean that it is unlikely that it was ever applied? Not necessarily, because as I said, it is in accordance with conducting practice. And the idea that people might have applied the metronome as if it was a conductor is really quite natural. It's not far-fetched at all. At the same time, if you look at music writing or at history in general in the 19th century, there is still a lot that speaks against such a system, as my introduction to metronome marking and tempo shows as well. For instance, all the instructions on the metronome, how to use it, how to apply it, are single beat. There is really no serious doubt about that. Or if an overall double beat application was an issue, then at some point there must have a transition occurred from that double beat application to our modern single beat application. No document talks about such a thing. Can't be traced at all. Those are just two examples that speak against it, but still the option is there and the option is quite well backed up. But the important point is, since all those systems are modern, they're like vehicles, they're modern vehicles in order to find ways to explain questionably fast metronome markings from the first years and decades of the metronome. And in my opinion, Sonnleitner's approach works well for Beethoven's own metronome markings. But of course, since it's a vehicle, it has to be verified for every single case. And that is the case for Chopin. And if we look at Chopin's Etudes, Opus 10, we see that if double beat is at all an option, and that is a big if, and if tempo is an issue, then Opus 10 number three is one of the first ones that come to mind. Because if I play that etude after single beat, it doesn't sound like a lento to me. And I know that Chopin in his autograph wrote Vivace Manantropo, but first of all, Vivace means lively, doesn't mean fast. That's a misunderstanding that's been repeated so many times. It means relatively fast, yes, but not absolutely fast. Then second, Chopin changed the movement name from Vivace Monotropo to Lento Monotropo 
and I'm sure he had his reasons. So obviously he wanted that etude to be sound like Calento. And once again, if I play it after single beat, it doesn't sound like Calento. It's playable, it's not about that, but it doesn't sound like Calento. So from a musical point of view, if one wants to apply double beats to those etudes, it must be for everything. You cannot just play 11 etudes after double beat, but Calento Manancioppo. So that is why I decided to present a recording that is inspired by an overall uh, double beat application of uh, Chopin's metronome markings. Speaking of Chopin, I know, and I expressed that many times, that the idea of double beat connected to Chopin's etudes is questionable. I mean, there are strong arguments that speak against it, but the option is there, in my opinion, and what interests me most is the musical outcome. I just love the richness of articulation and phrasing that all of a sudden appears. I love the poetry and the sheer beauty of all those countless details uh, in that wonderful music by Chopin. All right, so I hope this was helpful. Let me know your thoughts or comments or further questions in the comment section. Thank you. Bye-bye.